So, herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Ausgabe SE Talk und ich habe heute bei mir einen Interviewgast, Igi Tan, er ist der Managing Director, also sozusagen der Geschäftsführer von Altec Chemicals. Altec sagt Ihnen vielleicht etwas, äh, haben ein interessantes Produkt, was man mit dem allerdings genau macht, das wird uns der Igi selber sagen. Uh, Igi, thank you to have time, you are now in London um, and, and um, it's, it's a, a pleasure for me to have you Uh, on this in or the, uh, in this interview um, and um, when I look first um, at your your company and I look at the, the chart uh, you have a pretty good run uh, last year up to December and then it's coming down in January and, and since then is flat um, what was the reason why you have a pretty good run the last year in the, the second half um, and in this year, you have really no volatility or a low volatility, and really you are stable. Yeah, good morning, Joe, and uh, thank you for the time to talk to you. Uh, as you know, Altec uh, Chemicals is an Australian company, and we also listed on the Frankfurt Exchange. And uh, in the last three and a half years, we have grown our market cap uh, from 6 million Australian dollars to about 70 to 80 million Australian dollars over that period of time. Your question is, uh, you know, there's a bit of a flat spot this year. Basically, we announced the uh, senior debt from KFW IPEX Bank mm -hmm. around January this year, uh, and that's for 190 million US uh, for our project. Mm -hmm. uh, of which uh, hundred and which of which uh, hundred and seventy million US is uh, German ECA finance. So mm -hmm. it's uh, supported by the German government because our proposed plant in Malaysia has a very high component of uh, German equipment, mm -hmm. uh, and also our EPC contractor is a German company called uh, SMS Group. So a very large German company. So. Uh, I guess it's a bit flat because it's just uh, the market is just waiting for the next stage uh, of funding and uh, the next stage of funding is the balance of funds and we are looking at uh, three work streams. Uh, the first work stream is a mezzanine debt work stream. The project is uh, cash rich that it can support more mezzanine debt mm -hmm. and we're targeting uh, around 90 to 120 million of US mezzanine debt. We are also uh, conducting extensive roadshows around the world for the uh, equity component. And I must say that there's a lot of interest. We are seeing very high caliber uh, fund managers uh, and, uh, and we're getting a lot of interest there. So I guess it's a bit of a, a lull in the share price and volatility waiting for the next stage, but the project is uh, very exciting. Um, we are proposing to build a four and a half thousand tons per annum of uh, high purity alumina production. Now, as you know, uh, alumina is used in the uh, LED industry as well as the lithium battery industry. That's that's a good point. Um, then I, I, I think um, when you look at your presentation, um, we, we must talk a little bit more about uh, the the product itself. And when I look first uh, on, on your presentation, um, for me, it looks like um, or a lot of German think always you are a mining company, but this is not really correct. And, 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 and your name says it's Altec Chemical, Chemicals. Um, it's more a chemical process what you're doing. And the, the, the mining is only a small, a small portion of, of it. And I think in the presentation you write down that you mine only for two, three years, then you have inventory for uh, two, three months, and then you have inventory for two, three years for production. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So, the, yes, we are a mining company, but the mining component is uh, a smaller part of the whole. We use that as a feedstock mm -hmm. for the alumina that, that we're going to process uh, in our chemical plant. Now, just to give you, your listeners a bit of a background on what high purity alumina is, That's it's actually right, aluminium yes. oxide. Yeah, aluminium oxide, and the purity of it is actually at 99.99%. So we call that a 4N purity. Now, uh, what your listeners might also 
uh, realized is that alumina actually forms sapphire gemstone in the Earth's mm -hmm. crust. Uh, it, it's a bit like carbon forms diamond, mm -hmm. uh, alumina forms sapphire. Now, the only reason that the sapphire is a blue color is because of impurities in the alumina that creates the blue color, like iron and chromium. But did you know that, Joe, today that we make synthetic sapphire for our watch faces and our camera lenses and our smartphones? Um, and the reason we make, uh, the reason we need to start with high purity alumina is because we want the, uh, the sapphire gemstone as a clear glass on your watch face. You don't mm -hmm. want a blue tinge on it. Mm -hmm. So, so you need to start with high, high purity alumina. Now, the problem uh, with the smelter-grade alumina that is shipped around the world today is that there's so much impurities in it, they can't use that to make a synthetic sapphire. They have to start with high-purity alumina. And what's interesting about our product, Joe, is that it's a very high price item. So, the, as you know, prices goes up exponentially with purity in mm -hmm. chemicals. Uh, for, for example, smelter grade alumina might be only worth $400 a ton. If you make three nines, it's worth 6000 to 9000 US dollars a ton. You make four nines, which is what we're trying to, to do, it's worth twenty seven to 40000 US dollars a ton. So you can see it's a high price item. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we building a plan to make high purity alumina? Because there are two very big growth industries that is demanding high purity alumina. The first one is in the LED sector. So, you know, uh, very efficient lighting LEDs. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason it's so popular around the world is because it reduces electricity consumption by six times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, countries like Australia and Europe, they're all going to LEDs. Mm -hmm. Now, every LED has to have a sapphire wafer substrate. And in order to make a sapphire wafer substrate, people buy high purity alumina, they melt it at 2000 degrees, and then they let it cool over 21 days and it grows a single crystal of sapphire. It looks like a big ice block, but mm -hmm. it's as hard as diamond. Mm -hmm. So you, you cut it using diamond cores, you slice it up into wafers, and that's the building blocks of the LED industry. Now, in the LED industry, we see massive expansions uh, around the world. You know, Osram, the big German company, mm -hmm. has just uh, built a half a billion dollar uh, LED plant in Malaysia. We see expansions uh, from General Electric, Philips, Sunan, etc., right around the world. So this whole sector of LEDs is growing at about 15% uh, year on year. Uh, can uh, I the ask other big one question? Use uh, yeah, about the LEDs. Yeah. Which purity you need for the LEDs? Uh, the four uh, nine or or, or th what purity you need for the LEDs? Generally, it's gen generally it's four N. The four nine material yeah. is a, yeah. a big growth area. Uh, very some some people use uh, three three nines, but that's a very low quality LED. So, mm -hmm. uh, but the most important uh, feedstock is the four nines. Mm -hmm. Now. The other exciting industry that is demanding HPA is in the lithium battery industry. You know, you've heard of the Samsung Galaxy battery fires, which is banned on planes. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason a, a, lith a lithium battery catches a light is when the positive and negative terminal contact each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, today in batteries, there is a polymer film that keeps the positive and negative from touching each other. But unfortunately, uh, due to higher operating temperatures of these batteries, these polymer films tend to shrink and then they let the positive and negative contact. And so uh, this is a very big demand in the separator industry, the lithium battery mm -hmm. separator industry. Now, if you look at the, the slide 12 of our uh, presentation, it's an interesting uh, graph that I show about the changes in lithium batteries. Uh, on the top left-hand graph, it shows that the cost of lithium batteries are coming down. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is because the, the energy density is going up. So you're packing as much energy in a fixed volume. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, the re and the reason that the energy density is going up is because the cathode material in batteries 
are changing. So they're changing from initially lithium iron phosphate, they're, they're going to lithium cobalt, they're, lithium, uh, they're going to lithium nickel. And so as it goes up, the, the energy density increases. Uh, and that's why there's a scramble around the world for cobalt and nickel, because they see uh, that coming in the cathode material. Now, the consequence of higher energy density is the batteries operated at a higher temperature. And so these polymer separators, uh, which originally can only withstand up to 130 degrees, uh, are, are being lined with high purity alumina, which brings their temperature up to more than 250 degrees. Mm -hmm. So this has become a battery safety problem, and now separators, manufacturers, are coating uh, their separators with high purity alumina. Now, in, interestingly, the slide 14 shows a recent data point for these penetration rates. Uh, a company called W Scope is a Japanese manufacturing separator company recently announced that 40% of all their separators they produce uh, in this quarter is high purity alumina coated, whereas um, in 12 months ago, it was only 11%. Wow. And so we see this we see this as a very fast penetration in the sector. We estimate uh, that um, by 2025, it will require 15,000 tons per annum of high purity alumina in batteries because there's about 1.6 kilograms of high purity alumina in every electric vehicle. Uh, and we estimate that 15,000 tons by 2025 comes from the separator industry. Now, that represents four times the plan that we are going to be uh, building in Malaysia, four times in growth. Now, if you, if you add the, the LED demand on top of that, uh, we estimate that, uh, that it will require 86,000 tons per annum by 2025. Now, the whole market today is around 25,000. So a growth of 86,000 is something like 60,000 tons per annum of mm. growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's nearly about 16 times our plant of growth coming. Now, so you can see, Joe, that there is uh, the market where there is very strong demand, very similar to the lithium battery industry, lithium sector. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of expansions being announced. Basically, the incumbent producers have not announced any expansions, and any new entrants are about four to five years. So we're in a prime position where we are just in the final stages of funding uh, and um, getting our production underway. It will take us about two years to finish construction, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, will sh we should have our first product out by early uh, 2021. Uh, now, there is a, the other there, interesting uh, thing... Uh, uh, sorry, there is an yeah, interesting slide in, on, on 19, um, where yeah. normally um, high-purity aluminum is, is coming from. And they, they, they use them, go yeah. to bauxite, smelter grade, then the alu aluminum uh, metals, and then they make uh, the, the 4N out of it. But you use a different yeah. process. Is this right? Yes. So in, normally the current chemical uh, producers of high purity alumina, they uh, remember the smelter grade alumina has got too much sodium in it. It gets mm -hmm. locked in. It's very difficult to remove. So they can't use that material. They have to buy aluminum metal as their feedstock. Mm -hmm. They dissolve it uh, in alcohol, they hydrolyze it, and then they calcine it back to alumina. It sort of doesn't make sense, Joe, because it already started as an alumina. Mm -hmm. It goes to the metal and mm -hmm. then backs to alumina. So my question to you and the, the listeners is that if you have technology thing that can actually bypass the aluminium metal stage and go straight from the ore to just the alumina in one single step, will you be disruptive to the whole industry and will you be the cheapest cost producer? So instinctively, you say yes, because you take a very expensive feedstock out of the equation. And fundamentally, we have that technology, and we use uh, kaolin 
instead of bauxite. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I think you say I think you say kaolin in yeah. kaolin in German. I, from, uh, and kaolin is actually a, uh, got a lot of alumina in it and a lot of silica. And the reason kaolin is white is because Mother Nature has leached a lot of the impurities out of the material, and but we use that for the alumina content for free because we own this mine in Western Australia. We've got about 250 years of material, so we've got plenty of feedstock, and we extract it uh, and add value to it. Now, our processing plant we propose to build is in Johor in Malaysia, right across the road from Singapore. Uh, and the reason we pick Malaysia is because it's just operating costs. You know, something like 60% cheaper in all the materials the electricity, gas, and the most important thing, we also get a five to ten year tax free uh, window, uh, and that really makes us a very super competitor. Now, the the next question you probably ask me, Joe, is the chemistry. You know, yeah. who who came up with the chemistry of kaolin to alumina? Actually, if you search on uh, or Google kaolin to alumina using hydrochloric acid, you will find that the Swiss came up with it in the early 1900s. So this chemistry has been around for a long time, and the U.S. government and Alcoa did a lot of work in the 80s uh, when they were trying to feed their aluminum refineries with with uh, kaolin material. It works really well, but in the 80s, there wasn't much demand for high-purity alumina because, uh, you know, you didn't have LEDs and lithium mm. batteries and so on. So... Uh, it's only because of the recent demand of high purity alumina. We have just used existing chemistry. We applied it to our deposit in Western Australia, and wow, we thought this really works well. It's uh, it's disruptive. Uh, it is going to be the cheapest cost uh, 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 producer in the world, and that's where we employed the technology. Now, the economics, Joe, is very strong. The NPV for the project is 1.1 billion US dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, it At its full rate, it generates around 133 million EBITDA US per annum. And the operating cost is only about $10,000 a ton. Mm-hmm. Uh, the prices today in Japan uh, and that market is about $40,000 a ton. So mm-hmm. the margin is uh, around 74%, very strong gross margin. Um, um, now, who is our buyer? We have a yeah. yeah. Uh, you have a, a deal. I, th- I saw this with uh, um, you. You have an offtake agreement, I think, or with, or you have yeah, a ten-year off uh, offtake agreement. Exactly. Yeah. So we have sold all our product to Mitsubishi for ten years. Uh, it's an exclusive offtake. We don't sell it to anybody else. Uh, they don't buy it from anybody else. And as you know. A lot of chemicals that go through to Japan go through trading houses, uh, and uh, Mitsubishi will buy our product and then on sell that to their customers because they have customers in Korea, Taiwan, Japan in the LED industry and the lithium battery industry. So um, the offtake uh, is the next question: is do we fix the price for the material? Yes. Now, if you see the growth. If you see the growth that is coming in demand and you know that there's not a lot of capacity coming on, uh, it would be silly to fix the price. So we we have structured this offtake uh, as a uh, market price so that we can capture the upside. Do, do you have a full price uh, um, in there or you say, okay, we get only the market price? If any price, no floor we... price. It's just the market price. Okay, so yeah, the market price. So how the Germans um, come in? That's that's also for us as a German-speaking um, uh, area. How the Germans comes in, and that's coming through SMS, I, uh, I think, and and then the the KfW, the the financing stuff. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these projects, uh, you know, where is the risk in any project? It's the risk of execution. You know. I read a recent article where about about 105 projects, you know, uh, 67% of the projects have capital cost blowouts during construction. So how do we manage that risk? Well, we've partnered with a German company called SMS Group. SMS is a very large uh, engineering company. They turn over about 3 billion euros a year. 
Uh, they've got about a billion euros cash in the bank. Uh, and it's a, a family uh, private company. Now, what they will do for us is they will give us a fixed price lump sum contract. What that means is that they will build a plant and when the plant is operating at four and a half thousand tons per annum and producing the quality that Mitsubishi requires, then they will hand us the keys and then they can leave site. So they have a, a lot of uh, throughput and process guarantee in this contract. They also have completion guarantee. So if the project is late, uh, after 10 weeks, there are liquidated damages on a, on a daily basis. So very strong um, performance guarantees to support us on this project. Now, uh, SMS, it, well, it's a big steel group, has also a, a large division that is specialised in process, these kind of processes in hydrochloric acid. And uh, they, the reason they can give us a quality and process guarantee is because they have independently worked on this similar technology, a uh, kaolin to alumina using HCL, for uh, six, seven years prior to us. So uh, they came to us and said, uh, we can be your EPC contractor and give you all these guarantees because we also have done test work on this and we know it works. Now, And, and is SMS the, not the, the biggest shareholder now from, from, from your group? Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in the negotiation, we said, okay, rather than... We want you to have skin in the game. We just don't want you as a contractor. We want you to put some money to the project or the company. Uh, and so they have committed to uh, invest 15 million US uh, into the company and we have already received 4 million. So they're about a 8% shareholder. Uh, and so we are very happy to, to have them as the contractor as, as well as the shareholder. Mm -hmm. Now, on the, the finance side, we have now closed the debt of 190 million US with a, a bank called KFW, Apex Bank. As you know, it's owned by the German government, uh, and of which 170 million is export credit finance. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? Well, we happen to have 50% of our plan with German equipment, mm -hmm. all various German suppliers from the HCL recycling plan to heat exchanges and to, and so on. And also our EPC contractor is also a German company. So uh, export credit is really the German government underwriting the, the project to support their exporters. And consequently, um, because of that, the, the KFW can lend that money to us uh, for very low interest rates. Uh, and and long tenure, so mm -hmm. it's a low interest, long tenure loan. So that's the uh, the senior debt that's now been completed. Now we're focused basically on getting the balance of funds. Mm -hmm. The balance of funds are, are, are there are three work streams, as I mentioned before. Uh, mezzanine debt is uh, the first work stream. The second work stream is the equity part, which we are doing a lot of roadshows around the world. Mm -hmm. And the third part is possible. Uh, joint venture, partial project sell down, and uh, you know in this option we may we may find a big uh, industrial group that uh, wants this material uh, 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 because they see it as the future of batteries and 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 technology, uh, and so we are also uh, progressing that work stream. So On the mezzanine debt, we've already received the first term sheet mm -hmm. of 90 million. Uh, and so that's uh, well underway now. So when you think you can finish this uh, this three portion of of or the, the three next steps? Yeah, we we think that because the MES debt now is now moving to uh, final due diligence and documentation, it'll probably take about you know another six months. But we also realise that there is six months of piling. Uh, in, in Malaysia and site works to do before we even start constructing above the ground. So the company has decided that we will raise the money, uh, a, a portion of the equity amount up front within uh, uh, the, the next month and then start the site clearance and the construction work mm -hmm. and run that in uh, concurrently to the close of the mezzanine debt. So hopefully... Um, 
within a month or two, we'll start clearing the site and, um, and begin the construction foundation piling work. So we're we're running everything in uh, in parallel. Yeah. Uh, when I look at the last uh, press releases, it looks like that you bought then the 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 the, 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 the mine or the the, the land uh, of the, of the mine, and you bought also um, a, a part of an industrial park that you can build up the the plant. Um, so you're doing major steps yeah. in in this direction. So if a everything running fine, uh, that's mean uh, 2020 you're starting with uh, with uh, the production. Is it right? Yeah, yeah, and end of 2020, early 2021, yeah. we expect our first product out. Yeah. Um, so, in the next step is financial side. You have uh, the half of it with uh, the the the, uh, the German KfW, uh, KfW and uh, SMS is a big partner. So you have German engineering, German yep. financing on the one side. Uh, then you're looking for uh, balance the financing. So you're looking for mezzanine and um, uh, equity and maybe a potential a GV partner. Um, and if yeah, yeah, it's if everything running normal, uh, your your product should going or you you your your product should going uh, on the market 2021. Um, uh, perfect. Yeah. Iggy, thank you. I think it was a, a great introduction to your company. So we wait now for um, for more news coming from the financial side. Um, this, I think, is the yeah. next major steps, what, what we will see from the company. Yeah, and I, I think uh, once we start to uh, raise some funds and start the construction work, I think there will be a, a major re-rating. Uh, and um, and it's actually a, a very exciting project and uh, a good stock uh, to get in early. So uh, thank you uh, for your time, Joe. Yeah, uh, one my, my, uh, one last last question: Is there any technical hurdle, or or, or also from the mining side or for the, from the chemical side, that you see from this point they they, they can fail the project? Good question, Joe. Uh, a lot of people ask me where the risk is. Because it's the first plant of its kind in the world, it's disruptive. Mm -hmm. There is obviously the risk in the technical side. Now, the first way to manage the risk is to obviously have a, a very large engineering company to guarantee the process and the quality. But that's more importantly, we have very close hand in how we design the plant. So uh, we have built a lot of very conservative assumptions in the design of the plant to to manage the technical risk. So, so for example, I'll give you an example. Most engineering companies will design the plan at 90% utilization. So 90% on uptime and 10% downtime. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're an experienced operator like ourselves, that is a very op optimistic number. So we design our plan down to 79%, which means that the plant has to be bigger to produce the same tons. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of companies will do their recoveries and they say in the lab we get a recovery of 90%. But you know, Joe, that's in the lab where yeah. it's pristine condition. So what happens, you know, what happens in the plant? You've got to factor that in. So we design the plant to 60% recovery. All right. So if you have 60% recovery, then the plant becomes bigger again to make the same tons. Our ramp up is three years, which is uh, people say that's long, but you know what? That's a realistic number. Uh, we also make sure that the fee grade of the kaolin coming in, it should be about 34% in all our test work. We make sure the plant is only designed to take 30%, which means that the plant has to be bigger to produce mm -hmm. the same tons. So we, we, the way we manage what we want to do is uh, under-promise and over-deliver during the startup phase, and we build a, a lot of conservative assumptions now the consequence of that is that your capital cost of the plan it becomes more robust but we're mm. happy to fund that uh, because it takes a lot of the risk away when you start up projects so, so that's how we manage that technical yeah. risk so that that's mean also that you have maybe possible uh, positive um Yeah, uh, developments. So maybe you have a better head grade, uh, maybe you have better recovery rates, uh, and so on. So maybe then you are produce a little bit more, then you have a bigger plant. 
You are very clever, Joe, because <laughs> if the plant is designed to four and a half thousand tons and a and a German company is prepared to guarantee four and a half thousand tons, what do you think they've designed it to? You know, possibly the plant can do up to five and a half or maybe mm-hmm. six thousand mm-hmm. tons plant. But mm-hmm. that that is all the upside. The the key is to get running, to get the quality, to get it accepted, and then we we then optimize it and we think that it will be well be, be above the four and a half thousand yeah. tons. Iggy, thank you for the interview. I think it was a great one. Uh, and thank you for the time. Yeah. Good luck with the, the, the financing. No worries. And uh, I'm happy to yeah. see the uh, new pictures when you start to build uh, the, the plant. And uh, I'm quite sure we will see then some pictures uh, and so on so that the yeah. people can see the development of, of this stage. Thank you very much for your time, Joe. Thank you and good luck. Bye. Bye bye. Ja, das war jetzt ein äh, Interview mit Igi Tani als ähm, äh, ja, Geschäftsführer von Altec, also Vorstand von Altec Chemicals. Äh, und ich glaube, ähm, das ist insofern wirklich eine spannende Sache. Ähm, denn ähm, was macht die ganze Sache so spannend? Es geht um hochreines Aluminium, ähm, das eigentlich aus einem Saphir kommt. Quasi genau dasselbe wie ein Saphir. Saphir ist nichts anderes als wie Aluminiumoxid. Ähm, und äh, Sie sehen es gleich hier, wenn ich endlich mal durch bin. Ähm, Saphir ist ein Aluminiumoxid. Äh, können wir, äh, schöne Farbe. Die Farbe kommt von den Verunreinigungen. Und äh, Aluminium ähm, äh, Oxid wird verwendet, also Saphirglas, haben Sie sicher schon gehört von den iPhones und von den Samsung G9 Handys und so weiter, dass die heute halt ein Saphirglas haben, das nahezu äh, ja, bruchsicher ist, kratzfest ist und so weiter, weil sie einfach einen Härtegrad von 9 haben und zählt damit zu den härtesten Elementen. Das Problem bei diesem hochreinen Alumina ist, dass es 99,99% sein muss, weil sonst hat man nämlich eine bläuliche oder rötliche Färbung, das will man alles nicht. Ist klar, wer will schon bei seinem Handy die Farben nicht klar sehen, sondern mit einfach einem Blauschimmer. Das Problem dabei ist dann natürlich, dass diese Tonne dann richtig teuer wird und ja, Sie verwenden einen Prozess, also hier sieht man nur mal, dass man es verwendet für LEDs, für Glas, Allerdings auch als Separator für Lithium-Ionen-Batterien, weil, und das hat er sehr schön erklärt, äh, mit, äh, um die, die, die Lithium-Ionen-Batterie, also hier sieht man mal die Verarbeitung von Saphirglas, ähm, hier ist die Nachfrage von, von Alumina, ähm, weil die, die, die Preis pro äh, Kilowattstunde, äh, der Rückgang kommt vor allem darum, dass man nämlich mehr Energie in die Batterie reinsteckt. Und das erreicht man, indem man halt ähm, äh, vor allem ähm, neue Kathodenmaterial verwendet, Kobalt zum Beispiel, Nickel, Kombination von denen draus, deswegen läuft ja auch Kobalt und so weiter sehr gut und auch Nickel fängt jetzt an, langsam zu, zu laufen. Allerdings steigt die Temperatur auch dementsprechend an und dadurch kann man diese Separator, die man jetzt verwendet, nämlich Polymere, äh, Polypropylen, Polyethylen, nicht mehr verwenden. Und da kommt auf einmal dieses hochreine Alumina ähm, ins in, in Spiel, denn das hält es auf jeden Fall aus und dadurch kann die Batterie auch nicht zum Brennen anfangen und dadurch komme ich zu dieser höheren Energiedichte. Und äh, deswegen ist das, ähm, dieser Separator extrem wichtig. So, was macht die Company? Und jetzt kommt der, der nächste Schritt und das ist auch das Einzige, sage ich mal, was wirklich das, das Risiko ist. Hier sieht man die Produzenten von diesen hoch äh, reinen Alumina. Ähm, die verwenden diese herkömmlichen Prozessoren, verwenden als Ausgangsprodukt Aluminium Metall. Aluminiummetall ist auch einmal sehr teuer, auch seitdem nicht so einfach im Handling und machen daraus dieses Alumina 99,99%, also Aluminiumoxid. Ähm, sie verwenden als Ausgangsprodukt eine Porzellanerde, das ist das Weiße, also die, die, wo man auch quasi Porzellan draus macht, ähm, und machen das in einem chemischen Prozess zu 99,99% äh, dieses hochreines Alumina. 
Und das Interessante ist, ich meine, sie haben Reserven auf ihrer Mine von 250 Jahren, also das wird ja, geht ja noch nicht aus. Auch interessant ist das da, sie arbeiten zwei Monate auf der Mine, das ergibt drei Jahre Feedstocks, also für drei Jahre ähm, Ausgangsprodukt für ihre, für ihre Produktionsanlage. Denn die Größenordnung 4.500 Tonnen Jahrestonnage ist nicht viel, muss ich ehrlicherweise sagen, das ist relativ wenig. Die Mine, äh, die, diese, diese Plant soll in Malaysia bestehen, ähm, hinsetzen, also äh, passieren. Das ist auch ideal vom Platz her, weil es natürlich äh, überall in Asien natürlich sehr nahe liegt. Ähm, Osram zum Beispiel hat ihr LED-Werk auch in Malaysia gemacht äh, und von daher ist das eigentlich ein äh, optimaler äh, äh, Punkt. Was aber wirklich das Spannendste eigentlich davon ist, hier sieht man den Prozess, ist also alles uninteressant, verstehen wir sowieso nicht. Ähm, was allerdings wirklich spannend ist, ist, wer baut Ihnen diese Anlage und bauen tut Ihnen diese Anlage ein deutsches Unternehmen, die SMS Group. Äh, er hat selber gesagt, das ist eine Gruppe, die 3 Milliarden Umsatz macht, hat sich jetzt auch beteiligt, ist mittlerweile der größte Aktionär mit 8 Prozent. Warum können die, das? und die garantieren ihrem, ähm, dass die Anlage in der Zeit dort steht, sie garantieren äh, erst, ähm, wenn sie 4500 Tonnen quasi auch tatsächlich produzieren, dass das alles hinhaut ähm, und haben auch Abschlagszahlungen und, und, und. Also wirklich ein extrem interessanter Deal. Also die müssen wirklich an diese Sache glauben, sonst würden sie es nicht machen. Ähm, und die können es sich auch leisten. Man drei Milliarden Umsatz macht die Company oder eine Milliarde, hat er gesagt, Cash liegen, die können sie sich auch das leisten, weil die scheinbar an dieser Technologie schon sechs, sieben Jahre arbeiten und das ist sozusagen quasi der Prototyp, den sie hinstellen. Ein, auf industrieller Größenordnung und die wollen halt dabei auch richtig Geld verdienen und sie müssen auch noch weitere 11 Millionen, so weit ich es richtig verstanden habe, investieren. Dadurch wird ihr Anteil natürlich deutlich höher werden. Ähm, die KfW, also die deutsche KfW, hat auch eine Exportkreditfinanzierung äh, gemacht, äh, generell eine Zusage von 190 Millionen äh, US-Dollar, das ist sozusagen die, die halbe Anlage, weil einfach, ja, 50% der Anlage aus Deutschland kommt. Ähm, die Rest, was sie jetzt finanzieren, ist über Mezzanin, über Equity und möglicherweise über Joint Venture Partner. Und das sind jetzt eigentlich die nächsten äh, News, die rauskommen. Wenn alles läuft, soll die Produktion 20, Ende 2020, Anfang 2021 anlaufen und dort dementsprechend das Ganze umsetzen. Äh, jetzt wird es ein bisschen ruhiger. Die letzten News waren sehr gut. Sie haben das, das Grundstück, worauf die Mine ist, gekauft. Das ist ja sehr oft, dass dort das Grundstück nicht gekauft wird, sondern bei sehr vielen Minengesellschaften ist nur, dass sie das Recht haben, das aufbauen, die, äh, sich das Recht haben, abzubauen. Allerdings ist das Grundstück, worauf es ist, nicht gehört, sondern das gehört wen anderen. Dort machen sie dann einen Pachtvertrag, das kostet alles Geld. Nee, die haben jetzt das Grundstück gekauft und sie haben auch jetzt schon das Grundstück gekauft, wo die Produktionsanlage hingestellt werden soll. Und äh, das sind zwei wichtige Schritte mal. Jetzt, die nächsten Schritte sind sicher diese Finanzierungsschritte. Und dann werden wir sukzessive natürlich was sehen, wie die Anlage aufgebaut werden soll. Ähm, Ende des Jahres wird wahrscheinlich das alles erledigt sein. Zwei Jahre dauert die Produktionsanlage aufzubauen. Das heißt, Ende 2020 ähm, sehen wir dann äh, diese Anlage und auch die ersten Produkte draus. Und ähm, ist spannend, hat natürlich seine Risiken drinnen, ganz klar. Brauchen wir überhaupt nicht reden. Äh, vor allem habe ich auch, die, das war meine letzte Frage, ist vor allem eine technische Frage. Es ist die erste Anlage dieser Art weltweit. Da gibt es immer Probleme. Er hat gesagt, sie haben sehr viele konservative äh, Sachen angegangen. Die meisten im Labor war zum Beispiel Umwandlung von 90 Prozent, sie gehen aber nur von 79 Prozent raus. Äh, und, und, und. Äh, also sie haben die Anlage einfach größer geplant, was im Umkehrschluss natürlich heißt, dass sie auch mehr produzieren können, wenn alles so halbwegs läuft bzw. auch dann optimiert wird. Interessant ist auch noch, dass sie mit Mitsubishi ein Optik gegrimmt haben für die ersten zehn Jahre, dass die das Produkt auch dementsprechend abnehmen. Das heißt, in Summe muss man ehrlicherweise sagen, haben sie alles eigentlich erledigt, was sie machen können, sage ich mal. Jetzt ist eigentlich nur mehr jetzt die Thema, wie schnell können sie die Finanzierung abschließen, wie schnell können sie die, 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 die Anlageaufbau wirklich starten. 
Ja, und dann muss man quasi warten. Das ist jetzt natürlich das Negative. Ähm, da könnten jetzt in die nächsten Zeit überhaupt, wenn es um Finanzierung geht, nur ein bisschen Turbulenzen beim Aktienkurs sein und dann muss man eigentlich warten, bis das die Produktion läuft. Die Frage ist, und da tue ich mir relativ schwer, das einzuschätzen, ist, wie lange dauert es dann, bis das der Kurs anfängt zu anziehen. Ist es dann schon, wenn Sie die Finanzierung in Place gekriegt haben und dann ähm, fängt der Kurs schon leicht anzuziehen, weil dann sind eigentlich die Unsicherheiten raus? Oder passiert das erst dann, wenn die Anlage läuft ähm, und dort das Aluminium, äh, Alumina auf den Markt kommt, äh, der, Ma der Markt es auch abnimmt, weil es die Qualität einfach erreicht haben? Ähm, passiert es erst dann? Ähm, die Zukunft wird es uns zeigen. Äh, war auf jeden Fall ein interessantes Interview, spannend. Spannende Company und äh, von der Marktkapitalisierung braucht man nicht also, äh, reden, ist äh, nach wie vor extrem billig. Allerdings könnte es heute halt einfach nur zwei, drei Jahre dauern, bis das die Aktie wirklich ihr volles Potenzial zeigt. Aber die, 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 die haben auf jeden Fall die richtigen Zutaten drinnen, um ein richtig interessantes, spannendes Unternehmen zu werden. Allerdings braucht man heute halt auch einen längeren Atem dazu. Das war's von Alte Chemicals. Uh, Interview mit Igitan und uh, ja, viel Spaß bei Ihren Investment und viel Erfolg. Tschüss und Papa.